Well, he, uh, in fact, was past president of the American Association of State Climatologists, program chair for the Committee on Applied Climatology of the American Meteorological Society, research professor of environmental science at University of Virginia for 30 years. In other words, he knows what he's talking about. In fact, Professor Michaels, one of the leading climate skeptics, knows so much about what he speaks that the climate fraudsters in emails said that they'd like to punch him in the nose or worse the next time they saw him. So I thought I would get a scientist in the field on the show who knows what he's talking about and see if we can learn more about Climate Gate. Professor Michaels, welcome to the Savage Nation. Thanks for being with us. Well, how are you? I don't know, actually. You know, after all of that tryptophan from the turkey, it's very hard to say. Yeah. So you are at the center of the whole climate fraud story uh, in a sense that You've been screaming something's wrong from the beginning. Yeah, uh, I I wrote a book, you know, called Climate of Extremes, and I had a chapter on what was happening to the temperature histories. They were always showing more and more warming from the same data, which doesn't seem to make any sense. Wait, uh, let, me, let me see if I can translate that, Professor. Your book, first of all, Climate of Extremes, is it still available? Can people get it anywhere? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, okay. A fine book, but anyway, no, no, no. I mean, but if they go to uh, 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 the, the internet, they can buy your book. I want them to buy your book, and you'll see how many will. I mean, I make bestsellers, I really do. It's important that they, that they understand what you're saying. You're saying that all the data kept showing warming, which was didn't make sense to you. When the same data would be revised, it would show more warming than the same data showed before. That doesn't make any sense, and and that kept on happening. Well, now we, we, we read in these emails, these climate gate emails, you know, one guy saying, well, let's add 15 hundredths of a degree to the data uh, to get out the blip. The blip is the embarrassing cooling that occurred. Oh, my God. They actually were rigging the data by adding adding temperature to it? It's what it, – read them and weep. But that's – if you think that's bad – the real problem here were the attempts to influence what went into the peer-reviewed literature, uh, basically telling journal editors that, you know, if you publish a paper by this guy or that guy, me being one of this guy, we're going to boycott your journal or things like that. Oh, well, I, I told the audience what peer review has come to, unfortunately, which is just basically a club. And uh, anyone who's not a member of the club is excommunicated. It's very much like the uh, old religious orders. I don't think you disagree with that. You know, Michael, let me give you an example. I'm going to quote you one of these, one of these emails. This is from Mike Mann at Penn State. Mm -hmm. Either of these papers being in the next IPCC, that's the UN panel, report. Right. Kevin right. I will keep them out somehow, even if we have to redefine what the peer-reviewed literature is. <laughs> Do you, can you believe that? No. <laughs> now, aren't these the same guys who said when we see Michaels at the next conference, I'm going to kill him? Well, now they said uh, beat him up. Very, they're tempted to beat me up. You know why? Because I wrote the op-ed in October called "The Dog Ate Global Warming," and it was about how the this data uh, has all of a sudden disappeared that went into the warming records. The University of East Anglia issued a, a press release saying uh, we law we didn't have computer space in the mid 1980s, so we purged the data. Michael, that is BS. Have you ever heard of a nine-inch tape drive? No. Well, no, it's not been eaten. Now, wait a minute. The University of East Anglia has done a U-turn in climate change. They've agreed to publish their figures in full, they just said. Is that true? Wait a minute. They said they destroyed it a couple months ago. None of this makes sense. Well, I know none of it makes sense, but they even include threats of violence against you. They say, next time I see Pat Michaels, a climate skeptic, at a scientific meeting, I'll be tempted to beat the crap out of him. Very tempted. Well, that's Ben Satter. He needs some anger management, you know? You know what? Well, we're, we're, you know, look, we all know that science should be carefully discussed and analyzed and revised if necessary when, when new discoveries or new, new in, uh, data appear. This is a railroading. It looks like this is a railroading by powers that be. We know why. How come this railroad train can't be stopped? Well, I think we can stop it. I want to tell you... The guy who heads the United Nations panel is Rajenda Pachari, and here is what he wrote. Remember I just read you that thing where these guys said, well, we're going to keep the, these papers out even if we have to redefine what the peer-reviewed literature is? Yes. Listen to what he wrote in response. 
IPCC relies on t entirely on peer-reviewed literature in carrying out its assessment and follows a process that renders it unlikely that any peer-reviewed piece of literature, however contrary to the views of any individual author, would be left out. That's In other words, he doesn't care what anyone says. He's going to accept their lies. The, the IPCC would never keep anything out of their reports when these guys are emailing each other about how to keep it out of their reports. Well, we know the U.N. is corrupt. Why should we believe a climate scientist? He's probably not even a climate scientist. What is this guy's background at the U.N.? I'll bet it's not in climate science. He's an engineer. I Thank you very much. Uh, but you're an actual climate scientist. Well, let's boil it down for the average listener. I had uh, a gentleman on three years ago who was a climate skeptic to a certain degree. Beowulf, what was his name? I'm sorry. I, what, what, anyway, he said we're going into a global cooling phase. What is the actual reality here? The reality is there's no net temperature change uh, for the last 10 or 12 years. That if you, you, know, you, could, you could start it, say, I think in 2001, and you get a slight cooling trend. But the reality is that we have these computer models. Uh, none of them say this should happen. There's a famous – one of these emails has a guy at the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, saying, you know, we can't explain uh, the lack of warming. And he call, says, it's a travesty. And then he comes on when challenged in public on that and says, oh, I meant that we don't have – we're not measuring the temperature correctly because it obviously is warmed, and yet we don't see any warming. So in one statement, he says the computer models don't work, and then to get out of that statement, he says the data's no good. Nothing. But, Professor, when I heard Al Gore say all climate scientists agree and the science is in, I knew that he was lying. Because one thing I know about science is all scientists don't agree on virtually anything. And no matter what the field is, there's never 100% agreement. And moreover, science is something about testing, isn't it? It's not about doxy. And uh, Al Gore and the Minions are pushing this doxy on people because there are trillions of dollars at stake. In plain English, that's what it's all about, money and control. Yeah, well, that, that has been at the heart of this issue ever since it started. Did you know that the first big global warming hearing that was held in 1988 that broke this thing open, uh, they staged it, it was in Washington, D.C. on June 23rd, and then they turned off the air conditioners in the Congress so that people would... <laughs> in order to make the room feel hotter? I'm not making that up, okay? <laughs> I well, I, I noticed one thing which I've been saying for years is that every time there's a ferocious storm uh, in the northeast uh, in, in the winter in, in America, Al Gore is nowhere to be seen for several months. If, if this were such a wonderful case, why would you have to actually doctor the atmosphere inside the hearing room? That's what I want to know. But, Professor Michaels, we know that there's something wrong. We also know that they're rushing to judgment. We also know that Copenhagen would be a disaster if there's concurrence. Is there any, any chance that the, this disclosure, this climate gate, will stop this, this uh, train from speeding us over the, over the cliff? Well, I, I certainly think it, it very well might. You know, Mr. Obama is going to Copenhagen, and now he's bringing, he says the U.S. is going to reduce its greenhouse emissions by 83% by 2050. You know what? The Senate hasn't agreed to that. We may have a climate czar, but we don't have a king for the president. He can't make that commitment. And so what's going to happen is everything is going to get kicked down the road to the next U.N. meeting, which is November 10th, 2008, 2010, November 8th, six days after our election. You don't, oh, think, you don't think this is going to be an issue in the congressional election now? Oh, I see what you mean. We hope it is. We hope that the average person will be given an opportunity to study some of this and see the fraud and intimidation that's been involved and draw their own conclusions as to the costs. I mean, but look, you and I both know that the, uh, the medical reform stuff has cost the Democrats enormous political capital, and they're running scared right now. I don't think they can afford another scandal, do you? No, but you know what's odd? When, when the president said he's going to go to Copenhagen and, and do this, he is forcing the Senate to vote on this bill. And okay, so is that, is that a good thing? Because then the, the discussion will arise? Is that it? I wonder how many egos have been ruffled right now. People sitting on the fence saying, oh, my God, after health care, I don't want to vote on this. And look what just happened. Oh, uh, so he's forcing them to vote next year. 
Yes, because he he goes to Copenhagen and he says the United States will reduce its emissions 83 percent. That's equivalent to what's in the Waxman-Markey bill. I can't see how this cannot happen. Professor Michaels, when science fraud occurs, and it does occur, what are the ramifications? Shouldn't people be held accountable? Well, I am very scared about this one because when you, when you try and and alter what goes into the refereed literature, you know, the refereed literature is the Bible of science. You know that. That's like trying to say, well, Mark, you can't write that in the Bible because that's not politically correct. No. Right. So when that, so then. These documents that, that summarize the literature, things like reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, are then used by the EPA as the basis for regulation. Now we know that this literature has been tilted. So do well, they... You and I both know it. You have a Ph.D. In, in climate science or close to it. I have a Ph.D. not in climate science, but well enough in, in epidemiology where I can read literature I want to say something else. I've collected plants in the tropics for a long time. I haven't 